Uh, next uh, speaker will be Joel Salatin, who is a farmer, lecturer, and author, whose books include You Can Farm and Salad Bar Beef. Salatin raises livestock using holistic method, methods of animal husbandry, free of potentially harmful chemicals, on his farm in Virginia. His farm is featured in the book The Omnivore's Dilemma and the documentary film Food, Inc. Please welcome Joel Salatin. Thank you. A lot of people wonder, how did you get to where you are? And so as I've thought about this presentation, I've decided to just give a story of exactly how we got to where we are. It doesn't start at the beginning necessarily, but it does start with the need of um, people fleeing their Dilbert cubicles, being a cog in the wheel of a corporate uh, global elitist, uh, wanting to have a pleasant life in the country and asking us to grow ready to lay pullets for them. Now a pullet for you uninitiated, a pullet is a, a, a non-laying female chicken, okay, like a, like a a virgin or a heifer or something like that. Okay, so uh, we started raising these pullets for people that wanted them in their backyard, you know, for their McMansion farmettes out in the countryside. <laughs> and um, so we raised these hundred for this lady that called us and said we want a hundred pullets. And um, she called it, we raised them for five months. You know, they don't start laying till five months. They have that, you know, they got to go through puberty and all that sort of thing. And uh, so they started laying, and I called the lady. I said, okay, your pullets have begun laying. Now you want to come and pick them up. She said, oh, my plans have changed. I'm not going to pick them up. Well, we had 100 pullets. You know, you don't tell these ladies to just stop laying eggs. I mean, you don't say put a cork in it. I mean, they just start laying eggs. There's nothing to do except collect eggs. We had a customer at the time that was uh, a Washington lobbyist, actually. And uh, he came down and we were doing all this um, um, buy 10 dozen, get one free, you know, promotional things. And uh, now you got to understand, when we raise chickens, we, uh, we provide a habitat that allows the chicken to fully express its chickenness. The, the, <laughs> the, the number one question is, you know, what is the essence of chicken? Because, because it is in answering that question, the chickenness of the chicken, that you actually get the best egg. Just like, you know, you get the best bacon from the essence of pig. You get your best T-bone. You get your best tomato from the essence of tomato. See, we live in a culture today that, uh, that doesn't ask uh, about the essence of pig. Uh, they simply ask, how can we grow it fatter, faster, bigger, cheaper? That's all that matters, faster, fatter, bigger, cheaper. And so we have this very mechanistic uh, in our Greco-Roman Western reductionist linear uh, fragmented, compartmentalized, disconnected, democratized, individualized, parts-oriented thought process. We never think about the whole. <laughs> and so what happens is that we view as a culture, we basically view that pig or that chicken as just an inanimate pile of protoplasmic structure to be manipulated however cleverly hubris can imagine to manipulate it. And I would suggest that a culture that views its animals and plants from that type of manipulative, arrogant, disrespectful attitude will also soon view its citizens the same way and other cultures the same way. So it is asking the chicken, how can we fully allow you to express your chickenness that gives us not only the essence of chicken, but therefore the essence of egg. So we have these eggs, and this customer comes down and he says, it's immoral for you to be, you know, doing sale price stuff to get rid of these eggs. He says, I'll take a case. Now this was a truly entrepreneurial guy, you know, grandpa, he and his wife live up here, in, you know, uh, down in Gainesville near D.C. And uh, the next week he calls and says, I want two cases. Now a case is 30 dozen. The next week he calls and says, I want three cases. Now I knew that he and his wife were not eating 90 dozen eggs a week. <laughs> so I said, all right, time to fess up. What are you doing with these eggs? He says, well, I'm, uh, I'm taking them into these chefs in, in D.C. and they've never seen an egg like this and they're just going euphoric and they want more eggs. So he said, I've got a business proposition. He says, um, how soon can you get me... Um, Oh, 500 dozen a week. I said, well, I've got to buy the chicks. I've got to raise them up five, six, six months. Six months, you know, we can probably do that. 
he said, okay, well, this is the greatest uh, lie ever invented by man. You raise them and I'll sell them. You know, that's why farmers go out of business, you know, <laughs> believing things like that. But we were, you know, before you're old and wise, you have to be young and foolish. So we were younger and foolish, and we said, okay, we'll put them in. So we bought a thousand little chick pullets, raised them up. They began to lay, right when he got very busy with lobby efforts, you know, fluoridation of city water systems and vitamins, trying to make them into prescription drugs and, you know, all this stuff. And um, he just got too busy to market them. Well, now, instead of a hundred pullets, I had a thousand pullets. <laughs> Big problem. So I realized, you know what, if it's going to be, it's gonna, if, if it's going to happen, it's going to be me. It's going to be me. If it's going to be, it's up to me. So I had a, a retired chef friend who um, was chefing in Charlottesville, Virginia. So I called him up. I said, Hans, I'm in, a, I'm in a problem here. I need a hit list. I need a hit list of restaurants that are interested in the essence of egg. Uh, <laughs> and he said, oh, no problem. So he, uh, this was in the days before computers. So he got on his typewriter. He typed me out about... 12 uh, restaurants in the area and uh, mailed them to me. So I just started down the list. said, hello, I'm Joel South. And I've got the world's best egg. I'd like to show it to you. I've never had a chef turn me down because chefs are very artistic. You know, they, they, they want to get in. You don't see salt shakers in a, in a white tablecloth restaurant. They've got bowls so they can feel it and pinch it. You know, they don't have, they don't have uh, little Tupperware uh, egg, uh, white and, uh, and yolk separators. You know, they crack the egg in their hands and let the white dribble down through their fingers and, and uh, you know this is the, the, they, they get into it they're sculptors and so they love a new medium and so uh, my son and I um, he was a little little chumper and we didn't have a business card at the time you know so we uh, we, we put some eggs in the car we I called these six and I said I've got the world's best egg I'd like to make an appointment with you so we made six appointments in the in the day and um, that was what we could, you know, compress between morning chores and evening chores. Got in the car, put a couple do uh, cases of eggs in there and some sample dozen and uh, drove off to the first appointment. We made them one hour apart for, uh, for six hours. And um, the first place we went to, we went in. This was a, you know, small 50-seat white tablecloth, nicely appointed chef-owner operated um, restaurant. And... Um, Man, you know, he's busy. He's got burns all up and down his arms. You, know, you can tell when a chef is a chef. You know, their body's full of burns. And, <laughs> and uh, so he, he's, he's there with, he's got a stove there. And, uh, and he man, a few words. I walked in and introduced myself. And uh, he said, okay. And I opened up a sample dozen. He took an egg out. And he had a little uh, six-inch um, saucepan there about half full of water sitting on the stove, uh, not boiling, but almost. And he cracked the egg into it, dropped in it, and it, you know, floated. And, and, and he, began, he began studying the essence of egg. And it captured his attention. And um, waited a few seconds, uh, you know, 30 seconds or so, and he took a slotted spoon, a white saucer, and he gingerly pulled it out. By this time, it was clear that he was having a, 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 an epiphany. And he pulled this out, he dropped it on the saucer, and then he put the spoon down and he began to stroke it. <laughs> like you'd pet a kitten. <laughs> Daniel and I are standing there, our, you know, my son, he's about you know, six years old, we're sitting looking at each other, you know, whoa, what have we gotten into here? <laughs> and so, of course, I couldn't stand it. You know, I, I asked the chef, I said, so, so what, you know, what, what are we doing here? What's, what's the deal? And, he's, and again, he's he, man a few words. He says, I'll show you. Of course, they all have some, you know, exotic accent because they've all been trained in Europe and Switzerland and all this. And uh, so, so he, he takes, he's got a stack of flatted, you know, regular uh, fecal confinement factory salmonella E. coli eggs there standing. <laughs> so he takes one of those out and he drops it in the same pan. When the egg hits the water, it explodes. The yolk separates from the white. The white turns into what looked like little, uh, you know, little uh, packing peanuts, you know, little nerdlies. He points at it and he says, I can't serve that. He said, I'll buy 30 dozen on the spot. I just happen to have a case with me, you know, just in case, <laughs> in case we struck it rich. So I ran out to the car, got one. Now, we were, we were asking him to pay three times the price and cut a separate check. 
If you've been in restaurant marketing, you know that's suicide. Fortunately, we were too dumb to know it was suicide. And uh, so we went where angels fear to tread. And we went in there with this, and, um, and he bought them on the spot. Became a very loyal customer. Several weeks later, we found out the second part of the story. And that was that the very next morning, the very next morning, he was having a meeting of all of his staff to get together because it turns out, unknown to us, that for this little restaurant, the only one of, you know, 50 in the Charlottesville area, their signature, I mean, the only one that had this as their centerpiece menu item, that all restaurants kind of evolve around a, a kind of a centerpiece menu item, you know, their, their forte, all right? Well, this one, their signature menu item was Sunday brunch, water poached egg in hollandaise sauce. And the morning, the following morning after we showed up, they were having, he had called together his whole staff to look at all their options and their gifts and talents and resources, client base and all that, and decide what's to substitute for their signature menu item because they could not get enough eggs to hold together to make it work. And I always enjoy, and I always get chill bumps every time I tell that story, and I've told it a million times. But the point of the story is that if we devote ourselves to sacredness in our vocations, the world will rise to meet us. And I think too often in our culture, we, we don't have sacredness, we don't have honor, we don't have nobility of personal ministry. That story illustrates the essence of egg and the essence of chicken. And that is why they eat bugs and grubs and run on green grass. And that's why we move them to a fresh salad bar every day. And that's why we practice uh, nature's template and biomimicry and move the egg mobiles behind the cows so the chickens can mimic the birds that follow the wildebeest on the Serengeti but do this in Swope, Virginia, um, and, and, and scratch through the cow patties, sanitize the paddock so we don't have to shoot the cows up with Ivamec and, and things that make the meat so bad it kills all the bugs. Th th that's all illustrative of why we do what we do. And so, in essence, all of us, every day, we are writing a story and a legacy that will be told about us. And wouldn't it be uh, wouldn't it cheapen our lives if we're just doing the expedient thing? Just putting in my time, getting my, doing my job. I'm so tired of hearing, you, you know, uh, uh, people that say, that, that, that dismiss mediocrity and dismiss even uh, dishonorable deeds with, I'm just doing my job. What, did you check your mind at the door? Did you check your conscience at the door? You know, and, and so on our farm, we have been deeply and greatly blessed over these years to serve, you know, 50 restaurants and 2,500 families and, and to be able to, you know, see, see the growth of the operation. But you know what? We still don't and never have had a sales plan or a marketing target. We never had a, a benchmark that we're hitting. In fact, we've now made 10 value statements that are anti-Wall Street to keep us true to a value of faithfulness. Because what I've found is that serendipitously, my success is tied to a, the cumulative effect of everyday stories and faithfulness to injecting sacredness and nobility into every little action of my day. And when we put that kind of ministry Ours is a, is, a, is a ministry of healing the land. And when we allow that kind of sacredness and that kind of nobility to permeate every one of our actions, the world will be um, 
ennobled, the world will indeed rise up to meet us as we leave our legacies and our stamp of our life, our life's story, as it becomes our stories for our children and their grandchildren. What will they tell about us? And if they will tell about us, he or she was a person of nobility and sacredness in every aspect of their life. We will have raised a great legacy for our families and our heritage. Thank you very much. <laughs>